and this resistant, this resistant to drugs, it's a heterogeneous process that we, as we've just seen, that we can target with different drugs, with second line drugs, but still we need uh, a bigger armamentarium and that's what we are trying to work on. So how can we actually uh, face these problems? Well, we can target kit directly, as we've seen with different drugs we are doing this, these ATP uh, pocket inhibitors. We can also target kit directly, but with other strategies, as Dr. Dimitri is going to present in, in a minute. We can also target kit with other mechanisms that we know are important for kit, kit to function, but actually are not the same molecule as HSP19 inhibitors or CDC37. And we can finally target other things, as Dr. Petrinsky presented this morning, other uh, key proteins in combination with the targeting of kit, as we know. What do we use in the lab? Well, everything we can. Uh, this is just what our lab does, but there's other labs with uh, people uh, present here that work with animal models. We try to use everything we can. We use the tissue, we grow cells, and we analyze their constituents, the proteins and the DNA. What happens is that the current technologies now generate lots and lots of data on this side. We have, uh, as you know, from the Genome Project, and we've seen today a presentation on genetics. We can work on this side and we get a lot of information. But usually drugs work on this other side where in, at the protein level we usually work one protein at a time, much more slowly. So to overcome this distance from here to here, there's some studies and those are the ones I'm more uh, involved in and that's what I'm gonna present to you today is the functional genetic studies. They are closer to the protein, to where the drugs actually work, but they have this advantage of being high throughput, being systematic and very generating a lot of amounts of data. Okay, so these studies are based in two, two ideas, basically. Synthetic lethality is one of them, and loss of, loss of function is the other idea. Synthetic lethality is just uh, easy to uh, understand, thinking about combination approaches. We know that Glivet is a very good drug, but unfortunately some cells are still viable in the presence of Glivet. So we are trying to find other things that in combination with Glivec actually kill these cells. So this is just an esoteric name for an additive effect of two things that on their own are not enough to kill the cells. This is a major pillar of, uh, of these approaches. And the loss of function, here I, I, I went a bit too cartoony. I, I was trying to make it easy, so maybe it's too simple, but I think <laughs> it's a nice example. The loss of function approach is um, as follows. Uh, we may know about computers, for example, and we know what these wires are, and we know that if we take out this plug, well, the internet connection is not going to work, right, because this is the network connection. But if we have no idea, and actually in the cells this is what happens, we know that there's many, many wires. Some of them are clearly identified, and we know what they do. We know this is kit, so if we cut it, then the power goes away from the cell, but there's many that we don't know. So what can we do? We take out all these wires one by one. That's our approach. That's loss of function. And we see what happens. If I take this wire off, off and the screen goes uh, blank, then I know that that's the screen, right? If I take one and it's the mouse that doesn't work, we know that's the mouse. So that's what we do. But we do that in a very systematic way. We have thousands of computers and we just take one wire at a time. So we have thousands of cells, those are our computers, and these little viruses we use to take one gene at a time. We uh, shut down every gene, one by one, up to uh, 10,000 genes. That's the scale we are working, 10,000 genes in millions of cells. We keep these cells growing on their own or with imatinib because we want to know what in combination with imatinib is going to shut down these computers, these cells, okay? And in the end we analyze all this data. So doing these things we found some proteins that we knew about and some others that are unexpected and for us very interesting. I know that this wire is really important for these cells, CDC37. And it happens that we validate that in a single experiment. We take a cell we knock down CDC37 and we see normal cells, they have CDC37 and they work. They have kit, phosphokit, and they are active and proliferating. If we knock down with different tools this protein, everything falls apart, phosphokit, kit, the cells don't divide anymore. So we found here a very promising target. Now we try to develop drugs to use it, of course. This is shown in percentage of cells that are viable. The cells we start with after several days with these things knocked down they don't work anymore, they don't proliferate, and you can see that in pictures. These are images showing cells, normal yeast cells growing, cells that are growing with this protein blocked. So they grow much worse. Okay? So actually, studying the biology of this uh, CDC37 protein, we came up with this model. Actually, CDC37 is helping kit 
to work together with other old friends of us, HSP90, that we know is an interesting targeting yeast, to do its oncogenic function. So this way, we got an, many lists of that. Imagine we have 10,000 genes in lists and ranks, and we can cross them with other data sets we have, and we try to find which are the key uh, proteins. Here I'm illustrating another pathway, MAP kinase pathway, that has been already uh, mentioned. So several proteins on that pathway also came up from this screening approach, and indeed, when we target MAP kinase, the cells, the G cells, die in a similar way. We also saw that some of them become resistant, and now that's what we are trying to understand, why some of them become resistant. This is not only relevant in GIST. Some other sarcomas, and here is the same data coming from GIST, but we are now doing other screens with U-win sarcoma or liposarcomas, where some of the pathways are shared by different cancer types. For example, here is the PI3K AKT pathway. mTOR has been mentioned. It's part of this pathway, where we see that many genes score high in different data sets that we get. So this is my way to present you how we go from the genes to the proteins, right? Our lab is very much invested also in developing new generation sequencing techniques to develop more the story here at the structural level. But my particular project is closer to the protein. So that's all I wanted to tell you. Maybe I went too fast. Uh, I hope it's fine. <laughs> we, are, we are trying to to do combination uh, approaches to target not only kit but something else that synthetic uh, will create uh, lethal states for these cells and these high throughput techniques are helping us to create new hypotheses to then move to the clinical trials. Thank you very much. Well, well done Adrian. So it was quick but there's no test afterwards and I hope I hope you got a sense for the, the progress. One thing I want to point out, just to underscore, when, when Adrian was showing those cells up on the screen, those are all immortal GIST cell lines that have been established from our patient group, you know, where when you consent, when you undergo surgery, that cells can be used for research. We do our best within, you know, the limitations of funding and so forth to keep some of those growing. And when you succeed, it's a remarkable resource because not just our group, but those around the world can use those. It's been remarkably hard to keep GIST cells growing, and I think we're up to about nine GIST cell lines in the world. Eight of them have been established right here by this program. One of them, one of, one of, one of them was established by a really good group in Japan. But, 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 but uh, you know, so this, this work when Adrian is showing that you knock things down, you pull out the plug, and the cells go belly up, those are the GIST cells from our patient group. We make sure that those GIST cells, as they grow in the lab, continue to represent the disease. They don't wander off in some crazy direction where they give us bad leads. It gives, takes, takes a great deal of rigor and attention to do the work. So thanks, Adrian. So to the ma master orchestrator of all of this, just work to sum up and to make sense of it. And I'm sorry that we kept you waiting so long. We kept the, the, the program, but I think it was worth it. Actually, let's, let's, let's just as an informal show of hands, remember I, I suggested for the next time around three possibilities. One is we keep it the same, and we ran over. Another approach is reduce the number of talks and build in more time for discussion, fewer talks, longer talks. And the other approach would be we add an hour, you know, whatever we need to the session. Let's start with, <laughs> we're going backwards, aren't we? So <laughs> let's, let's start with leave it the same, just as a show of hands. I'm not going to vote. Our, 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 next, our, our, next, option, our next option is uh, same time frame. This was 10 a.m. until 1 p.m. Fewer talks, more time for discussion, a show of hands. Okay. And then our last option is going to be add an hour Whatever it, wow, well, okay. <laughs> I think we're convinced, yes, okay. <laughs> thanks. Well, thanks, Jonathan. I'd like to thank everybody for staying this long, even though we didn't add the hour, we're adding it anyways, so. Um, and I, I just wanna call attention to the fact that what Jonathan said is, is absolutely remarkable, that eight out of the nine useful GIST cell lines were really developed by his laboratory. It, the, the guy is a horticultural genius. He can grow things, nobody else can. 
And, and the fact is, he has done this with the support of terrific people in the laboratory. I liked what Tanya did and had the rest of his laboratory come up here because for this scientist to train in Dr. Fletcher's laboratory is really a, both a badge of courage and a badge of honor because Jonathan is a, is a terrific investigator and I'm privileged to work with him. So with, with that, I wanted to also say that literally 10 years ago this month, this was the cover of Time Magazine. That's May 28, 2001. And basically, this was talking about revolutionary new pills like Gleevec, but we can't rest on the laurels of this, that really we have to ask ourselves, what are the next generation of therapies for GIST and other sarcomas? And the key thing that all of you may have come across, for those of you with GIST, for those of you with other sarcomas, for those of you who may have family members, why should the public care about sarcomas when they are such a drop in the bucket of all cancers? If this is the whole cancer problem, this little slice of the pie, and if you take that little slice of the pie and you push it over there, this is all it is. Sarcomas and GIST all put together are only 1% of all adult cancers. That's a trivial little number. So why should the public care? This is why the public should care, because this knowledge from this 1% of human cancers called sarcomas is absolutely critical to break down old negative feelings that cancer is unbeatable. We know that cancer can be beaten. And the fact is, this solid tumor called GIST has really paved the way. And it's really informing us through the kind of groundbreaking work that Jonathan and his colleagues are doing through great collaborations with colleagues around the world about how we can diagnose and treat other more common forms of cancers. Because 25 years ago, before GIST was even known to be separate from other kinds of cancers, this was the outdated view of sarcomas. You go back into the literature even 17 years ago, and you say, you see all these studies about sarcomas, and it's just a black box. Sarcoma was this monolith. Nobody really understood it. So how do you open the black box? You do research. And if you look at that, let me, let me just blow this up for a second, because I think it really helps us understand this. Sarcomas come from stem cells that really would have turned into something that helps hold the body together, be it GIST, which is helping to hold the intestinal tract together and make it work properly, be it the bones, be it the fat, be it the cartilage, whatever. That's what sarcomas are coming from. So now we know the box was only a cover. And with the kind of research that we've all been doing here, we can put different kinds of sarcomas and different kinds of gist into the box as things that are separate that we really can target. So this, I've been using this slide also since 1986 because my prior life was about stem cells and growing blood stem cells. And I like this because this is sort of the stem cell idea of ice cream. And if you blow that up, Ice cream can come in many forms, but of course the stem cell for ice cream is that undifferentiated lump at the top. And you could get a you know, popsicle, you could get a sundae, you could get an ice cream cone. So really when we think about this, you get where I'm going with this, that there's an analogy to thinking about this. Good science doesn't have to be hard, by the way. This is what I taught my, my kids, this is what I teach my students. If it's really good science, it tends to be kind of elegant and anybody can understand it. If you don't understand it, we probably don't understand it either and we're probably just trying to cover that up. So I think that's why we need research so that we can explain things as simply as this, that, that really it makes a difference. And when you have the knowledge of what the stem cell is and how it turns into different kinds of sarcomas, be it just angiosarcoma, Ewing sarcomas, liposarcomas, leiomyosarcomas, whatever, we're going to make more advances in this as we start to carve cancer into different things. Well, you heard from Tanya, a survivor and a thriver with this disease, that she was first diagnosed with a different disease. And that's because of this, because the pictures of sarcomas, let me go back one just for a second. These look identical. GIST actually can look remarkably similar to other kinds of cancers, including something called leiomyosarcoma. And one of the first things Jonathan taught me when we had a couple of patients with these diseases, they look the same, but when you look at the chromosomes, remember Judy Garber was talking about the karyotype? When you look at the karyotype, there's all sorts of mistakes in this one. And this one looks pretty normal. All the little chromosomes are going two by two, kind of the animals onto Noah's Ark. These little chromosome pairs are pretty normal where you can hardly find a normal chromosome pair over there. So why is this and what's the disease? Even though they both look the same, the one on the left is a real leiomyosarcoma. The one on the right was a gist. And that was before anybody knew Kit existed. This is the kind of breakthrough that Jonathan in his humble, quiet, but incredibly insightful way saw 10 years before anybody else saw. And for 
because of that, it's been a remarkable team effort about how do we take this knowledge and translate it into new therapies because we knew there was no effective therapy for GIST before kinase inhibitors. This is a patient, if you're not looking at, used to look 